I think we're ready for our grand finale, and what a pleasure to have uh, Jessica and Jesse um, be our final keynote speakers for this year's Acadia Conference. Um, Jessica Rosencrantz and Jesse Louise, Louise Rosenberg um, are the founding partners of Nervous Systems, a Somerville-based studio that works at the intersection of science, art, and technology. In their own words, they created nervous systems to explore a design approach that connects process and form in a context of interactivity and openness. Their trajectory focuses on generative design methods that use both algorithmic and physical tools to create and fabricate innovative products and environments. Drawing inspiration from natural phenomena, they write computer programs based on processes and patterns found in nature and use those programs to create unique and affordable art, jewelry, and housewares. Founded in 2007, their story is really a dreamer startup story that began with clandestine fabrication in school basements, after which Nervous System came to pioneer the application of new technologies, including 3D printing, WebGL, and the use of many generative systems. The studio releases online design applications that enable customers to create products in an effort to make design more accessible, affordable, and ethically made, promoting the use of manufacturing methods that do not require la large facilities or massive manual labor, often using rapid prototyping methods. Their tools allow for endless design variations and customization. They also release their source code under a Creative Commons license to encourage others to work in this manner. Jessica Rosenkrantz is an artist, designer, and programmer. She graduated from MIT with degrees in biology and architecture in 2005. She studied architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design from 2005 to 2008, before leaving to, find, uh, to found Nervous System. She's currently a lecturer at MIT in the Department of Architecture. Jesse Louis Rosenberg is an artist, computer programmer, and maker. He studied math, also at MIT, and before founding Nervous System, worked at Gary Technologies in building modeling and design automation. Both principals have lectured extensively in venues that include MIT, Harvard, SIGGRAPH, and the IO Festival. Their work is included in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian Design Museum, and Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Their designs, have been featured in a wide range of publications, including Wired, The New York Times, The Guardian, Metropolis, and Forbes, uh, just to name a few. Please join me in welcoming Jessica and Jesse. Wow, that was quite the introduction. I hope I can live up to our own introduction. <laughs> This is our first time at Acadia, but it's certainly a conference that I've been following for many years with great interest, and we're really excited to share our work with you today. We started Nervous System, as you just heard, in 2007 when we were both still students. We were sort of thinking about it as a creative outlet for doing weird cross-disciplinary cross experiments that didn't really fit into the structure of our educations. My background is in architecture and biology, and Jesse's background is in math and computer science. And we wanted to make a design studio where we could really seamlessly combine techniques from these different disciplines. So Nervous System works in many different materials and makes a myriad of different products. We make jewelry and clothing, furniture, lamps, jigsaw puzzles, and sculpture. And we work with materials like 3D printed metals and plastics, rubber, wood, and traditional metal smithing. And sometimes people kind of struggle to define what it is we do, what is our discipline, and sometimes we do as well. But what unites our body of work is really not these products or materials, but our generative approach to design. And our medium is really computation. And using computation to adapt processes and patterns found in nature into design tools. Our projects you'll see very often stem from some sort of natural phenomena. Our hyphae project from 2010 was inspired by how veins form in leaves. So we often start by looking at scientific research into how these processes can be modeled computationally. This was based on work by Adam Runyons from the University of Calgary, which we translated his paper into an algorithmic system that we could explore this kind of pattern space of venation and try to see if we could develop new types of structures. 
So our intention in studying these natural systems isn't to simply mimic them or make a direct copy, but to sort of understand and adapt to these processes in novel ways for design. So although leaf veination is a 2D process, we can kind of abstract it into a 3D system and then use these tools to design products. So this is a collection of 3D printed lamps. And like the leaves on a tree, each lamp is unique. So we grow a new structure for every lamp we print. In order to produce these designs, which are all one of a kind, we really need to work with fabrication techniques that allow for the creation of one of a kind designs for similar costs to cookie cutter ones. Mass production really doesn't work for our design studio. Computer controlled techniques like laser cutting, 3D printing, water jet, all of these great things we've been hearing about, open up all sorts of new possibilities for making. They enable us to make incredibly complex objects easily. They make it possible to create one of a kind designs priced competitively for making ones that are all the same. And additionally, they're now becoming available all over the place. They're in public libraries and uh, schools and even sometimes people's homes, which is putting precision manufacturing in the hands of more people than ever. However, this is all still more of a dream than a reality. And a big part of that equation is missing. For us, that part is software. How do you create the designs? Design software tends to be very expensive, difficult to use, and it doesn't typically take advantage of the variation or complexity that digital manufacturing makes possible. So one of the things that we try to do in our studio is explore new types of playful design experiences that can leverage simulation and the web to make it possible for anyone to create. So an example of that is this app called Cell Cycle, which is something we made in 2010, where you can go on our website and customize your own cellular rings, bracelets, or art objects. And it uses a real-time physics simulation that you can play with and sculpt and morph to create your own pattern. Our design systems are very inspired by the complex dynamic processes that we see in nature. These are processes that grow and adapt to different conditions, and the resultant shapes that we see are expressions of those processes and conditions that generated them. Uh, computers offer new ways of making things, but many design softwares try to reproduce the methods by which we made things before computers. We've got software that gives the experience of drafting, sculpting, or oddly painting. And these are somehow trying to translate how we've traditionally worked with physical materials into a strange digital analog of those experiences. Generative design systems propose a kind of different direction. Taking inspiration from nature's process-based designs, it focuses on developing interactive processes that we can engage with. So instead of creating static designs, we're creating dynamic systems. And instead of drawing structures, we're interested in growing them. So now we're gonna go kind of more in depth into one of our projects called Floriform, which focuses on this side of simulations of natural systems to create designs. And it sort of starts from this very fundamental question of how do organisms go from a single cell to a complex differentiated structure? And if a single cell were to just grow and divide uniformly, it kind of end up as a formless blob. However, through carefully coordinated subdivision and differentiation, biological systems produce structures with specific forms and functions. And one explanation of this is this idea of differential growth, which is really a very simple idea. Things grow at different rates in different locations, and through that process, certain structures emerge. But how is that growth controlled? So a very common example that's well known is plant tropisms. So for instance, a plant can redirect its growth towards light by differentially elongating the cells on the opposite side of the stem. So there's a gradient of growth that comes from an environmental light gradient. And you can also apply the same kind of idea to a surface. So you grow more on one side than the other, and it makes curvature. And our project kind of started when we came across this research from a professor at Harvard named Mahadevan, who was studying the form of certain leaves and flowers. And it has sort of proposed this model of differential growth that these forms can be described by growing more towards the edge. And what was really interesting 
to us about this was, unlike these other models, like plant tropisms that we'd seen before, where curvature is sort of one-to-one -one with growth, here, a very complex form emerges from a very simple idea and model of growth, just grow more towards the edge. If you look outside in nature, you're gonna see this all over the place, the edges of flowers, uh, the leaves of a cabbage, lettuce leaves on your salad plate. It's not limited to the botanical world though. Forms that can be described by this model of growth are all over the place. The arms of jellyfish, the form of an anemone, certain types of coral, bryozoans, mutant cactus, fungi. They all have these ruffled forms. This one is a particular favorite of mine. It is the sea slug, Elysia crispata, also called the lettuce sea slug. And these guys are just totally bizarre. Um, it has a dense surface area on its back of ruffles, which at first seemed pretty impractical. You're like, why does he have all these ruffles? But it turns out they're totally functional. It has a strange eating behavior where instead of eating an entire algae, it rips the chloroplast out of an algae, that's the part that photosynthesizes and turns light into sugar. And then it stores those chloroplasts on its back. So it's using this ruffle as a mobile solar farm for producing all of its food. Uh, that's actually called kleptoplasty, which is a pretty cool word. And I just insert this here because you all need to know about this sea slug because they're basically the coolest animals that exist. <laughs> also, they're ruffly. You also see <laughs> these types of forms in a particularly cool plant mutation called fasciation. You may have seen the flower on the right. It's uh, commonly called the brain flower, Solotia cristata or coxcomb. And that's actually a mutant form. It's supposed to look like what you see on the left, a sort of branching Christmas tree thing. But it has this weird mutation fasciation where the growing point, the apical meristem, instead of branching like it's supposed to and producing more branchy forms, it continues to grow and elongates as a line. The continued linear growth of this fasciated growing tip leads to these incredibly convoluted forms. So we wanted to start to play with this space of form in between the branching structure and these line-based growths. So we built a computational model. And so this is sort of our base condition of undifferentiated growth. Rather than just expanding uniformly like you might suppose, it makes this sort of amorphous blob. And then we started to look at kind of these other distributions of growth. So these are all the same starting surface, but we first start with a line-based growth, which kind of looks like certain cacti. Then we have a point-based growth, which splits, and that naturally forms branches. And we have this sort of original inspiration of an edge-based growth, which creates these convoluted ruffled forms. The color is the rate of growth. And underneath this, we built a simulation that is a physics-based elastic surface. So it's based on a mesh. That mesh sort of has edges that grow based on the rate of growth, which is once again color. It subdivides to adapt as it's expanding and taking up more space, and it has these collision bodies that prevent self-intersections. After we've begun to construct a system like this and established a few baseline of growth modes, the next thing we do is try to explore how manipulating material properties and environmental conditions in our simulation can allow the growth to be sculptured and controlled. I would describe our practice almost as a kind of digital gardening except for instead of cultivating plants, we're cultivating algorithms. Ultimately, we want to craft systems that have their own innate behaviors, but that we can also interact with and manipulate. As we're developing our software, we encode sets of influencers, gradients, and manipulators that enable us to sculpt the growth. What we're really interested in is the interplay between what the system does innately and our manipulations. Some of these manipulations are as simple as changing a material property like the stiffness of a surface, and others are more complex relationships that change through time. We translate many of our digital experiments into physical sculptures using 3D printing. Uh, the one on the bottom is actually combining two of our growth systems together, hyphae, which we showed earlier, and floriform. We also explored using full color 3D printing to kind of physically show the growth rates on the surface that formed that structure, and as well as constructing these animated sculptures based on 19th century zoetropes that physically animate the growth process. 
At Nervous System, we, oddly enough, disseminate our ideas and experiments through affordable objects. So we used our Floriform system to grow a jewelry collection. For every piece of jewelry, we crafted a unique growth process. We then materialize these things again using 3D printing. Uh, these are nylon jewelry pieces produced using selective laser sintering and sterling silver pieces which are cast from 3D printed waxes using traditional lost wax casting. We feel strongly that ideas like these shouldn't be limited to academia, research, or theoretical projects, but should diffuse into our daily lives. Everyday objects can embody complex ideas. So now it's time to switch gears and talk about a project which is basically completely different than the one we just showed you, which reflects the other focus of our work, which is really this intersection of digital fabrication and co-creation. Kinematics is a project where we attempt to fuse fashion, software, and 3D printing to examine how digital fabrication and generative design can impact the way we create clothing. How can we leverage these tools to allow for customization and personalization? By working in a process-based software approach, we can open up our software directly to non-designers. So we started to think about how 3D printers could be used to explore new types of textiles. And this might sound a bit weird at first because textiles are sort of viewed as this very traditional handcraft natural material, but textiles are really human constructions. Raw materials transformed to have completely different behaviors. And the arrangement that these <laughs> materials have in space almost matters more to how they behave than the raw material itself. So whether it's woven or knit, it's much more important than whether it's cotton or wool. And 3D printing, opens up new possibilities to make much more computationally sort of complex arrangements of material in space. So how can we use this to kind of create new configurations that can have kind of meta properties that change through space? Textiles also have kind of a long history in computation itself. The Jacquard loom, which was first demonstrated in 1801, used punch cards to encode intricate weaving patterns. And so it can kind of be viewed as a precursor to the computer. So we can view textiles not only as human constructed materials, but traditionally computationally mediated materials. So this project started when we began to try to make a textile using 3D printing. Um, 3D printers typically print rigid materials, but by structuring a design as an interlocking structure, you can create things that start to behave more like a fabric. We wanted to create a textile whose material properties would vary through space, things like rigidity, porosity, drape, and shape. We started to play with this idea, making really small scale pieces, uh, like these necklaces that you see animated on the screen. And we really liked the way that they were moving. They were kind of like a hybrid in between hard and soft things. Um, the things we were making were around the size of a necklace, because that's about how big our 3D printer was but I immediately started dreaming about could I make like a long ball gown made out of this material and how would that move and what would it feel like and what sort of sounds would it make? Um, but I immediately hit a problem, like how would we actually going, go about doing that? Often when we want to make very large things using, or even moderately large things, using digital fabrication, we end up breaking it down into lots of small unique parts, which then need to be organized and assembled into the final object by hand a task that's often more time consuming maybe than any other part of the process. Sometimes I might say that you've taken computation and you made your life a little harder rather than easier. Uh, but what if we could print our thing all in one piece? We had an idea that maybe we could take advantage of the fact that the structures we're making are flexible. And what if we could use the fact that they can bend and fold to just find a smaller configuration to make them in? could we essentially use simulation to compress our designs? Then they could be made efficiently with no assembly. A large complex design made of 5,000 interlocking parts could be printed in a folded configuration that unfolds from the printer into its intended shape. Now, if you can make a garment fully in 3D, you have to sort of think about designing it a little differently. Bodies are three-dimensional, but clothing design normally happens totally in 2D flat patterns cut from flat material and then painstakingly reconstructed to make a 3D shape. But if we can design using this process, then we can create uh, clothes directly from 3D scans of your body, making truly custom fit clothing where nothing ever has to be cut, sewn, or assembled. So we had this kind of initial concept, 
but there were a lot of pieces that had to come together in order to actually make it a reality. So we sort of have all of these different issues that have to do with fabrication, design, how do we incorporate the body and make clothes that actually fit, and then sort of most fundamentally, can we simulate these structures and actually find a form that's small enough for us to print them? So the first piece is sort of very straightforward, kind of the whole project hinges on these hinges. And so we sort of spent a lot of time just designing hinges and trying to work within the limitations of the printer and the material that it prints, which is nylon. And the print has kind of these tricky things where it has different error and tolerances depending on the orientation that it's printed in. And so we ended up just designing dozens of different hinges. So this is some examples of the ones that we made and physically tested. And we wanted to you know, miniaturize this part as much as possible because the smaller the hinge, the smaller the components, the more fluid of a textile that we could make. And that means that we were sort of working on the edges of the tolerances of the machine, and if we get it a little bit wrong, it will either fuse together or fall apart. So we started off making some small tests. This was the first piece we printed crumpled up, which was a necklace, and that worked, so we scaled up. And then we created a belt, which was the first piece that we made based off of a 3D scan of Jessica. And we wanted to see if this sort of larger scale would also work and if we got the fit right. And then this was sort of our first prototype at scale with more than a thousand unique pieces that were all printed with no assembly and sort of trying to understand more about how it would interact with the body, how it would move and feel. So at the same time as we were doing these physical prototypes, we were also thinking about how to generate these designs. All of those things were generated by software that we wrote that has no user interface whatsoever, not even like a visualization of what's being generated. So it made it very difficult to design. And our ultimate goal was to create a tool that was easy enough for anyone to use to generate their own clothing. So we were working on this app called the Kinematics Cloth app, which is on our website. It is a tool that allows you to create custom fit clothing in the browser. Uh, like all of our web apps, it's built on JavaScript and WebGL. This one allows you to customize the fit silhouette and pattern with a sort of intuitive interface, even though it's making something very complex, uh, like garments made of five to 10,000 interlocking pieces that would be very difficult to do with normal tools. In the shaping phase, you can sculpt the silhouette and hemline of the garment. You can also paint densities to pattern the underlying textile structure and apply different module styles at the end uh, from pattern to perforated. Designs can also be uh, saved and shared and edited by other people. So there was this other issue that we had to deal with of bodies. And 3D scanning is becoming more and more prevalent. We sort of have these ubiquitous depth scanners like the Microsoft Connect, sort of not anymore. <laughs> and we wanted to be able to use these affordable tools to capture people's body shapes. However, if you've ever worked with 3D scanning, you know that it can be very glitchy and noisy and unpredictable. You have shadows that make unmeasurable areas. And even if we could have a perfect 3D scan, we still have to understand the body. What pose are they in? Where are the neckline, the waistline? And so while we were working on this app, we came across some people that we're working on this exact problem, which is a startup called Body Labs. And they created a parametric body model based on machine learning that takes a 3D scan and fits it to this kind of parametric mesh where any point on one person's body maps to the same kind of physiological point on another person's body. And so this gave us a way to both work with scan data and take a design on one person's body and map it to anybody else's. And so finally, the last piece is simulation. Can we simulate these complex structures with weird behaviors to reduce their size for printing? So the simulation is based on a rigid body physics solver. And while our initial sort of video and concept showed crumpling up a garment into a ball, Unsurprisingly, this is not exactly the best strategy. Just like normal clothing, 
folding is a way better strategy for fitting your clothes into a suitcase or a 3D printer build volume. So the resulting shape of this dress was reduced by 85%. We can also use the simulation to understand how the garment's going to move and drape and fit prior to printing them. Because we're kind of making this weird material that we don't totally understand, we want to have an understanding of how it will behave before we actually manufacture it. The first dress that we printed was uh, sort of for the Museum of Modern Art. We had met Paula Antonelli, who's a design curator at the MoMA, and she had uh, seen our video that I showed earlier um, about the dress idea. And she was kind of thinking about maybe acquiring a dress for the permanent collection of the museum. But the thing that was a little unspoken is I wasn't totally sure if she realized that we had never made a dress, that it was <laughs> just a video of a concept that we thought about. But we were super excited to have the opportunity. So we said, yes, yes, no problem. Um, and then this video was filmed actually the day before she needed to present it at an acquisitions meeting to like get the okay to acquire the dress. And we were like going to Shapeways in New York to see it come out of the machine. And I was like watching these technicians who were depowdering it. And we're really unsure at this moment, like is it going to be a solid lump of plastic or is it going to be a wearable dress that works? <laughs> And it was very nerve-wracking, but it worked. So we were able to make a dress that came out of the machine and was wearable immediately with some depowdering. Next slide. OK. So then this is the first dress that we made. It's a custom-fit garment. It's an intricately patterned structure of more than 2,200 unique components, which are all interconnected by more than 3,300 hinges all 3D printed as a single piece in nylon using selective laser sintering. While each component is rigid in aggregate, they behave as a continuous fabric, allowing for the dress to flexibly conform and flow with body movement. Unlike traditional fabric, this textile isn't uniform. It varies in its rigidity and drape and flex and porosity and pattern through space. And most importantly, the entire thing is customizable from fit and style to flexibility and pattern. Since our initial research uh, in 2013 and 14, we've extended our kinematic system to include other types of 3D printable fabrics. This garment, the kinematics petal stress, was inspired by feathers, petals, and scales. And it adds a new layer of components to the dress which sheathe it in a directional landscape of overlapping plumes. So this next project, we're currently collaborating with New Balance to see how 3D printing can be applied to performance footwear. And can we use additive manufacturing to make shoes that perform and fit better? So we've been designing midsoles for running shoes that are 3D printed in a TPU elastomer. And one of the focuses of this project, which is sort of a bit of a departure for us, is kind of a focus on data. And the sort of nerve, uh, New Balance Sports Research Lab collects lots of different data from runners, collect pressure data from the underside of a shoe to get how much force a runner is exerting during their stride. And we were sort of tasked with how can we transform this data into a structure. So we explored kind of different ways of translating it to these space-filling 3D structures, trying to look at creating midsoles that respond to the data both functionally and aesthetically. So currently, we're working with these open cell foam structures that are inspired by you know, variable density structures seen in bone or wood that can respond to environmental stresses. So these structures provide more support where more pressure is applied. Here we're comparing midsoles of two different types of runners. On the left, there is a midfoot striker, on the right is a heel striker. And so this is sort of an ongoing collaboration where we're trying to leverage 3D printing and computation to change the way that we make shoes. So this is a demo we created where a customer can customize not only to their data, but also to their running preferences and styles, aesthetics. And really looking to see how can we put these kinds of tools into kind of a mass manufacturing workflow. 
Okay, so for this last part of the lecture, we're gonna do something a little different that we don't normally do, which is talk about unfinished projects and things we're currently working on, so don't judge us too harshly if the slides are ugly. What I wanna do here is talk about kind of the way we approach our work and things we're interested in and also how these projects end up evolving. Normally when people like us in the previous 20 minutes talk about our work, we plot a very straightforward trajectory where like we had this project and a test on certain themes and it had such and such constraints and we use these techniques to overcome the constraints, blah, blah, blah. And then there's maybe like a few roadblocks on the way or dead ends, but ta-da, there's a pretty straightforward path and we arrive at this really cool thing. Um, now maybe some people actually do work that way, but we certainly don't. Our work tends to be a very tangled web of projects, themes, and techniques which are intertwining over many years where seemingly super unrelated things end up with uh, very large influences over each other. This is the projects, themes, and techniques which we're about to go over of things we're actively sort of researching or looking at or working on and we tried to draw this as a web like connecting the lines between the two things, the three lines, but it came so confusing to look at because everything was interconnected so we just decided to go with the three lines sectioning here. So I'm gonna start actually at the end of a thread and then we're gonna sort of thread our way backwards to figure out how the project came to exist. So this starts with a project that we did earlier this year for Form Labs for the launch of their new SLS 3D printer, the Fuse One. It's a chain mail bodice, which was printed as a, in a single piece. Now, in a normal presentation, I might say that this is a, somehow a continuation of the kinematic system, which I just showed you, and maybe in some ways it is. I mean, after all, it's 3D printed clothing. How far away can it be? Um, but the sort of techniques that we use to accomplish this are super unrelated and came from various different fields. Form Labs had asked us to make a demo part for their new machine, and they thought it would be pretty neat if they could print a kinematic stress on their machine. We took one look at the machine, and we basically told them it was impossible. It's one-tenth the size of the machines we normally use, and there was basically no way in hell we could fit a dress in their tiny machine. However, we started to think about things like chainmail, and there's been like a great history, actually, of chainmail projects in 3D printing, um, particularly Yanni Freedom of Creation's first chainmail dress. And we were thinking that a chainmail garment could compress a lot more and might fit in their machine. In fact, we had years ago played around with the idea of making a version of kinematics that would be chainmail. Um, this rendering shows a structure that we generated back in the day uh, of our naive thought of how to turn a mesh into a chain mail. And it follows a, a sort of chain link pattern called the Japanese style because it is found in uh, ancient Japanese armor where each uh, triangle has got a loop going through it and then also one in the center. However, this was basically a failure so we just sort of shelved it and never showed it to anybody because the structure doesn't really fit well. It's got all these like rings pressing into your body in weird ways and we also had a more fundamental problem. We absolutely couldn't simulate it. Our kinematic system uses a very standard rigid body physics solver, and it works well because we have a simple representation of the structure. We're not really working with the geometry. We're working with a simplified representation where we just have triangular wedges interconnected by hinge constraints. The problem with chain mail is that it really can't be represented as a simple constraint, like a hinge constraint. So the entire system would only be collisions and geometry. Most rigid body physics systems only represent convex bodies in collisions. And a ring is essentially like the total opposite of a concave body. It's like all whole and no convex. So it'd be very expensive to simulate. Not to mention that there's an order of magnitude more rings in a chain mail thing than there are triangles in kinematics, like 2,000 triangles versus 10,000 rings, um, which boiled down to using dozen, dozens of gigabytes of memory and uh, most of our attempts to simulate chain mail looking somewhat like this, which is really not what that was supposed to look like. So rather than kind of being directly related to kinematics, this new generation and simulation of chain mail really has more to do with flowers, mushrooms, and foams. So it starts with our floriform project, which we still work on. This is a chandelier that we made for the World Expo in Kazakhstan this year. And when we were first implementing the simulation for Floriform, we were exploring using finite element methods, but we came across this paper that had kind of a simpler approach called Discrete Shells by Greenspun and other authors. 
And this was an early paper in 2003 from kind of a group of research that became known as discrete differential geometry. And this group makes modeling and simulation techniques that preserve the properties and structures of the mathematics of smooth surfaces, but in the discrete setting of a computer. And it includes researchers from dozens of different institutions. And they not only make really impressive projects and papers, but they're really elegant ideas embedded in them. So when we were exploring kind of what other research came out of this group, we discovered another paper that would be kind of key to floor form. And it was geodesics in heat by a researcher named Keenan Crane. And this was a novel method for computing distances on surfaces, which is what we use to control the growth rates in floor form. And what makes this method so interesting is that rather than directly measuring distance on a surface with something like a graph search, it actually uses diffusion to compute distance in this sort of kind of mind-bending way that I won't go into. <laughs> and so when we come across research like this that sparks our interest, we like to keep tabs on what the same researchers are doing in the future. So a couple years later, the same researcher, Keenan Crane, came out with another paper called Stripe Patterns on Services. And this is a method to produce kind of a pattern of lines on an arbitrary surface that followed a specified direction field with constant spacing. And the patterns are beautiful, but also potentially very useful. You know, this sort of system of lines can really form the basis for a lot of different design systems. So for instance, the authors of the paper thought, as I imagine many of you are thinking right now, what about a corn armadillo? <laughs> what we thought of was more like the gills of a mushroom. And we were so just intrigued by this stripe paper and method that we just were trying to think of ways that we could use it. So we, as you have seen, are very interested in clothing and textiles. So our first idea was actually to turn the stripe pattern into a weaving system, in contrast to traditional woven textiles where there's a rigid warp and weft grid. These textiles would follow direction fields, allowing for non-uniform behavior. The stripes are encoded as angles parametrized on the surface, and the lines can be simply interpreted by looking at the cosine of the angle. To turn it into a weave, we make two stripe patterns rotated 90 degrees from each other. We can modulate the height of our stripes by the sine and cosine of the angle parameter to create weaving. We could use this stripe system as the basis for making a weaving pattern on any surface, which we can then control by varying direction and density. This is like our very first earliest uh, printed prototype, which we made in flexible resin on our Fuse 2, Fuse 1, not Fuse 1, uh, the thing that's not the Fuse 1, the resin one. <laughs> what is it called? I don't remember. Form. The form one, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, when it came time to think about chainmail structures again, we realized that a traditional chainmail is a lot like a weave. There are alternating lines of links which are rotated in opposite directions. We can make chain mail by similarly having two orthogonal alternating line patterns. At the intersection of lines with the same color, we'd create a link. We then rotate the links around the stripe directions, one way for one color and the opposite way for the other. This lets us turn any surface into a chain mail structure, which can be 3D printed. Now, hopefully you're still following along on this winding design path so far, we went from a simulation of growing surfaces inspired by flowers to a stripe pattern that reminded us of mushrooms to a odd chain mail clothing generation system. But we, if you've been following along, we still actually haven't tackled the problem of how do you simulate these chain mail structures efficiently. So this is gonna take us down another weird path uh, back into cellular foams. So obviously we love all things cellular and we hadn't really started playing with 3D cellular structures till we started our work with New Balance. And we were interested in how we could vary these structures through space, changing density, thickness, directionality. And so we sort of used these same ideas on a bunch of different projects with finished and unfinished. We're working on a 3D printed porcelain tea set that's 3D printed with a ceramic resin. Uh, this was made on a Formlabs printer and it's fired just like traditional ceramic resin except that it produces very noxious smoke. And 
The design is that handles are sort of replaced with a cellular foam surface, which provides a handhold to insulate from heat. We also created a jewelry collection called Corlaria, which focuses more on changing directionality, deforming cells in 2D. And then these are created using uh, photochemical etching in brass and then formed into 3D shapes using a hydraulic press. So we also wanted to think of other ways that we could vary these sort of lattice structures for different functions. And so we started to look at oxetic structures, which as other people have discussed here, it's a material with a negative Poisson ratio. When you pull on it in one way, it expands in all the other ways, same thing with shrinking. And they can have very interesting properties like in an impact, as it compresses, it becomes more dense. And there's been a lot of work in these structures in 2D but less in 3D, and some of the main examples are kind of more mechanical, so like the Hoberman sphere is kind of a famous example. And while researching oxetic foams, we came across this paper about a method of manufacturing them, which takes a regular open cell foam, compresses it, resets it in that compressed state, and then that compression kind of leads the members to buckle and rotate in ways that creates an oxetic structure. So we thought maybe we could do the same thing, but in simulation. And instead of compressing it, we would have the edges of a foam expand. And that way, the foam would maintain its designed shape, and we could grow the edges differentially to create a gradient of oxetic material. So first we had to figure out how do we do this sort of simulation. And so once again, we sort of looked at this uh, pool of research from this discrete differential geometry group. And there was another paper called Discrete Elastic Rods which sort of turned out to be a bit of a dead end, sort of still a very interesting paper, but couldn't quite get the constraints of several rods together to work quite right. And so we sort of continued our search for methods that could simulate elastic rods. And we came across another paper from 2016 called Position and Orientation-Based Kosarot Rods, I don't actually know what Kosarot means, but it's essentially just another elastic rod. And so this sort of followed a type of simulation called position-based dynamics, which is sort of different from other simulation systems because rather than using forces to model most things, it uses constraints. And Ultimately, what this does is it sacrifices accuracy for simplicity, speed, and stability. And this paper has kind of augmented a traditional position-based system to add an orientation to each rod element modeled as a quaternion. And so we implemented this method, and armed with this, sort of grew our foam structure. We started with just a regular lattice because we pretty much knew how we thought that should behave and what the resulting structure should be. And this roughly did the right thing, but it still didn't quite have the kind of dramatic oxetic behavior that we were interested in. And so we sort of shelved that temporarily. Meanwhile, uh, around the same time as we were doing this, we had released a jigsaw puzzle called the Infinite Galaxy Puzzle. And this was a puzzle inspired by the topology of a Klein bottle. So it's a kind of weird puzzle that has no beginning and no end. It also has no top and no bottom. So pieces from one side of the puzzle flip over and seamlessly connect to the other side. And the image ends up spanning both sides as you construct it. Like every time it's different and it makes a continuous picture of the galaxy. It went unexpectedly viral like right before Christmas last year. So then after surviving that and then dealing with the, all the puzzles we had to make, we started to think like we should probably make more puzzles because it was very popular. Um, and for the past five years, we've been making puzzles, but they've all had this very similar cut style, um, which is based on the formation of dendritic crystals. So we decided it was time for something new, and we weren't really sure what that new thing would be until one day we were debugging this oxetic foam structure. We were like, oh, let's just look at it in 2D to see what's going on. And we let it grow like a little bit too long, like what you just saw in the video, and all of the edges became like very long and filling up all available space and started intertwining and colliding with each other. 
And the resulting pieces seemed like they might make really cool jigsaw puzzle pieces. So thus, our new puzzle system, Maze, was born, and we just released this new collection of jigsaw puzzles, which are inspired by the colorful banded forms of agate. Everyone has a completely unique shape, image, and also cut, of course. And we launched these last week. Uh, if you'd like one, unfortunately, they sold out because we have a serious jigsaw puzzle problem at Nervous System. <laughs> and please don't buy any more jigsaw puzzles. Okay, so now, how does this come back to Chainmail? So we'd been working with all of these kind of line-based simulations, and these position-based dynamics were really fast and easy to work with, and we realized that if we could represent our Chainmail links with lines instead of as solids, it'd be much more straightforward to simulate. We didn't actually even need the elastic rod part, just the collision system. And we made this kind of first quick test of the idea, and we're immediately surprised just how fast and stable it was. This is sort of running in real time, and it's dangling from a single fixed point, which can often be very unstable. But this was working well. And in fact, it worked far better than we expected. We still weren't actually sure if we'd be able to fit uh, our, our chainmail bodice inside of their printer, but we ended up being able to compress this, which had over 11,000 parts into less than half the volume of the printer. So it ended up being far more intricate and compressed than any 3D printed garments we'd made before. And so what was kind of the point of this whole convoluted story about making a 3D printed chainmail shirt? The point isn't really about the chainmail shirt at all. It's really just about this kind of journey of discovery and where everything that we encounter and learn contributes to an understanding that guides our work. And that it happened to circle around to this particular project at this particular time is just happenstance. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing this beautiful and interesting work. Uh, we have a few minutes for uh, questions. So somebody's gonna start passing around some uh, microphones to the audience. Um, yeah, for a few. Does anybody have any questions? We have answers, maybe. <laughs> Possibly not. Hello. Thank you so much for that. That was an incredibly interesting lecture, and I think it's very refreshing to see people walking through all of the nooks and crannies of the process that led to a final product. Um, part of that process was going through a lot of academic papers and being able to pull from them to get the techniques you guys use. So my question is, how are you finding these incredibly niche, fantastically specific papers that are within your capability to understand and being able to apply them? Where are you getting these papers? <laughs> well, we, we certainly slowly increase our capability to understand over the years, which helps. And it kind of like builds up over time. You know, we've been doing this for about 11 years now. And like we were kind of saying, we encounter one interesting paper and that has several authors. Those people have other papers. They work in different institutions. We sort of follow those lines. Then, of course, you know, Google helps. <laughs> Google Scholar, especially. And so it's just sort of organic. We follow our interests and end up looking at things. And sort of like we described, one thing just kind of leads to another. You know, it's not, it's not a very fast process, necessarily. Like, we might encounter a paper like the Stripes paper and just kind of keep it in the back of our minds for one or two years before we actually do anything. Hi, uh, I was wondering about the negative Poisson, if you're still working on that and you're gonna make a dress that expands when you're turning. <laughs> um, because I would love, I was working on something similar and I would love to, to talk more about that. And the other question was, how are you thinking with materials? So you showed a lot how digital fabrication processes influence your designs, but I was curious if you're looking at other materials um, and what are the next generation of materials you would like to work with? Thanks. 
while we're somewhat still working on the oxetic structures thing, it wasn't going super successfully. We printed some of the parts that we grew and they did have oxetic behavior, but it was very subtle and we wanted something to be more dramatic. And then we got sort of sucked into other things. So inevitably we'll come back to it, but it's not on the current things I'm working on this week type of schedule. But I'd love to talk to you about whatever it is you're doing because that sounded really cool. Um, in terms of materials, I think we do tend to show like mostly our 3D printed work, but we work with a lot of materials. We do a lot of stuff with sort of traditional metal smithing stuff, and we do a lot of stuff with photochemical etching of metals. Um, in terms of what are materials I'd love to work with, I don't know. I, I'm obsessed with coral and coral reefs, so I mean, I'd love to work with living things. Designing a coral reef would be practically the best thing I could do. I don't know what Jesse's answer is, because we always disagree, so. <laughs> Your answer's good. My answer is good, he said. Hello. Uh, so, um, so j just a dumb question. Um, are you guys still using processing for uh, the platforms that you're developing? Or, and uh, another comment is, uh, you guys were looking more passionate a few years ago in uh, Hello World uh, video. Are you still passionate? <laughs> no? Did you just ask, did we used to seem more passionate and now we seem like old and dried up? No, I think you said the opposite. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Hopefully we're more passionate now. We do still use processing, but not sort of as our primary tool. We have certain projects which are implemented in processing that we continue to use and work on. But most of our newer work is either implemented directly for the web in JavaScript or it's written in C++. So basically all of the computational intensive simulations that we showed are um, written in C++ and vaguely based around the creative coding environment open frameworks. Thank you for such a great talk. Um, in the sense of that you want that Coral becomes like your favorite project to do, um, you're showing kind of all of these amazing simulations that change over time. And then it's almost like when 3D printing happens, it like takes a snapshot. Have you ever thought of a fabrication or are you working with fabrication and materials that could grow over time or are fabricated over the length of time like the agate or the tree or the coral? That's a great question. I mean, sort of yes, but mostly no. I think a lot of what we've ended up doing in our studio is making things that we can afford to make and also things that we can sell, which is like a super pragmatic answer. But when we started out, we we're just like two people with no money and we wanted to build a design studio. So we naturally focused on a scale of work that we could materialize and also afford to share with other people because we didn't want to be in the business of making like super high-end luxury goods. Um, we have one project we've been collaborating with scientists at Rice University, which is about uh, growing living cells in structures. So that's like the most like yes answer, but that's not really like our project. We're like one collaborator among a team of many people working on that. Uh, I love the idea of doing some larger scale work in the coming year. We're thinking about doing a large outdoor sculpture that would have plants growing on it. So that could be maybe a collaboration with nature, but um, more hopes and dreams at this point than actual realized things I can show you. <laughs> Hi, thank you for such a wonderful talk. And um, I think it's one thing that's fascinating is that your process is so rigorous and rooted in research. Um, and yet your objects that you create are things that people would normally think of as everyday, not so considered objects. So there's a really interesting tension there. Um, I think your approach would be really useful at the architectural scale, and I think that's a, a question that was just asked, but I would really love to see you guys working on, on the building scale because the built environment could really use your approach. Do you, do, is there any, um, besides kind of funding and time, is there any other limitation that you see um, from getting there? No, I guess it's, it's mostly money and <laughs> opportunity <laughs> and... <laughs> Well, I, mean, I mean, it's a little like bit like manpower because our studio is um, five people in size. So the two of us who are the designers and programmers and then an amazing support staff of three other people who help us with answering emails and packing and shipping things and physically making stuff. So we are a little bit time constrained. But I, if you want to collaborate on a project, Caitlin, I'm there. <laughs> I mean, there is somewhat of a tension, I think. Like, in some ways, a lot of our work is really about 
personalization and making these one-of-a-kind objects, which a single person can have. And architecture is kind of like imposed. It's kind of like the opposite of personalization. You know, You're you going to start like a war. We're in a room of architects. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not like necessarily a bad thing, but it's kind of counter to this idea of like customization. You're not going to customize like a public building for all of the public. Who knows? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> no question is too small or large. You have a whole four minutes and 28 seconds. <laughs> um, have you ever considered something that's like um, the Voltron concept? So you have like multiple of these uh, pieces that come come together, and then they make uh, something that's more powerful, and it's a giant fighting robot. Yeah, basically. <laughs> We've sort of thought about that for jigsaw puzzles, which is what it makes the most sense for in our context, of having like, you know, you could have a distributed puzzle where your puzzle fits with somebody else's puzzle, and then somehow you could randomly find a stranger that bought this connecting puzzle with you. It always comes back to puzzles with Jesse, always. <laughs> Hi, I'm just curious, uh, how strong were the 3D printed fabrics that you made and the chain mail? And also, uh, what hinge structure did you find was the most effective? Well, I'll, I'll hand you this when we're done. I'd, I'd say they're pretty strong. You can break it if you try. You could break it if you try, but that's true of most things. <laughs> but <laughs> we do sit in it, so it's not like it's so precious you can't wear it. I would say they're certainly not practical. I don't want to like make some sort of claim that they're like can compete with normal clothes. They're definitely more of a research project for us where we're like trying to get towards a certain idea that is not practical yet. They may be the some of the most practical 3D printed clothes ever made, but 3D printed clothes are still not competing with fabrics on any level. But I'll, I'll let you hold this afterwards. Pretty good example. And then did you ask which hinge did we decide on? It was the one in the bottom right corner if you happen to take a photo. <laughs> of the screen. <laughs> There's a diagram on our website. It's the same diagram, bottom right corner. OK. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, um, it seems like you always have like this goal in mind. And like e the way you presented, there seems to be a clear trajectory. But I was wondering how um, much your goal is also influenced by the research and by the iterative sort of process. And also coming from such different backgrounds, how much um, your roles overlap and sort of what you each bring to the project. Well, I don't know. We, we don't actually plan really that far ahead. So I don't know if we really have these broad goals that we're working on. We more like have three or four projects that we're thinking about. And then if we, one of them for some reason has more time and money than another one, that, that's what we end up working on. In terms of our roles, I mean, my background's math and computer science, so I tend to focus more on the math but we both program. So I'm sort of working more on like the physics stuff and Jessica works more on making it do something useful. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's a little weird because I feel like the longer we work together, the more like it becomes harder to distinguish what the roles are. You're definitely captain of math. That much <laughs> is true, but. <laughs> You've also become much more interested in design like over our 11 years of working together, whereas it used to be design was my area and you were like, I'll do the math. But now you do a lot of design as well. And I spend a lot of time debugging your crazy systems that are way too complex that you can't figure out what's wrong with them. So it all ends up intertwining. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your amazing work. Um, on your first projects, I saw a slide that showed the cellular growth schematic and I was wondering 
well, what I immediately saw was an analogy to urban planning. I was wondering if you've come across any papers that have studied cellular growth and made that connection. I don't know if we really have a good answer for this one. No? no I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly when you like read books about people talking about things like leafination patterns, like, oh, well, some of them look like street networks or like organic city patterns that emerge, but it's not my area of, of expertise, so I can't really evaluate those claims for if they're realistic or not. But I, I, I can't direct you to a certain paper, but I'm sure there are papers, because there seem to be papers on everything. There's one more question here. Okay, thank you for your talk again. Um, I just wanted to, so I have two kind of questions. One, um, how, do you, how do you guys balance the, the research that you're doing that, and you're developing and then also the ability to scale something up? So when something goes viral, how do you allocate your resources when something like that happens and you have to kind of shift gears? That's the first question. Second question is, have you thought about like licensing your software, your plugin that you came up with to maybe architects where they could get either give that to the architect or give that to the, the user to be able to design their own um, structures. You could program in the structural qualities and things like that into, as, to your inputs um, to kind of scale up in that sense. Well, the answer to the first question is poorly. <laughs> we had like three or four projects that we were working on when the Infinity Puzzle thing happened and we had to just basically like drop them all for several months, some of which still haven't been completely picked up yet. And it was sort of a month or two of just putting out fires like all the time of like, turns out our mail server can only send 500 emails a day and nobody's getting emails anymore and just things like that. For the second. <laughs> the general answer is, you know, making something for ourselves is fairly straightforward as far as these things go and it's still very complex. And then making something that other people can use and maintaining it is about 10 times as much work. So, we don't really look to like license our work, and if we were, it'd be kind of completely changing our business model and the way that we work and sort of the staff that we would need. So I don't necessarily preclude it as a possibility, but it's definitely not something that we can just like turn on a dime and say, yeah, we'll do that. We'd need to hire a lot more developers and have like a business model where we provide support and you could call us on the phone and get help, which like Jesse's saying, we're not 100% against that, but it's definitely a completely different thing from what we do now, which is get to be like weirdos who hang out in our studio and look up pictures of sea slugs and then program anything we want whenever we want to turn into a piece of jewelry, which is pretty fun. <laughs> Okay, we'll wrap it up there. Join me in thanking Jessica and Jesse. Thank you.